Hello and welcome to the ITC Entertainment World podcast with me, Jazz Wiseman. And as always, I'm joined by my brilliant co-hosts, Rodney Marshall and Al Smudge. Hi, chaps. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. Good to be back. Yeah. Hi, Jazz. Hi, Rodney. Great to be back. In this season, we're doing things slightly differently. Instead of focusing on an actual series and thinking about all 26 or 28 or 30 episodes or whatever, we're going to look at an individual episode from a series. And to kick us off, I'm sure you might have recognised that music. We are looking at Thunderbirds and the man from MI5. This one is a particular favourite of mine because it's kind of where the Thunderbirds team decide to do ITC spy craze. It's not atypical, which is quite fun. I don't think we should probably talk too much about the setting up of Thunderbirds. It's pretty well documented. There's a lot of books out there. There's obviously been fan societies. And if you wanted to find out more about Thunderbirds, it's pretty easy to do that. Before we actually get into the episode, I don't really remember Thunderbirds until the sort of late 70s, I think. There was a ITV repeat somewhere that was on in the school holidays. I must have been about 10. But I do remember this one being like a sort of standout one for me then. I don't know if you guys want to add your first memories of seeing Thunderbirds. My first memories of Thunderbirds are actually the merchandise going around to friends' houses. And nearly everyone seemed to have Thunderbird 2 with Thunderbird 4 in it. And it was probably through playing with toys at friends' houses that it got me watching the show when it was on and repeats. I'm very much the same. I, I'm not, well, I, I was around, but uh, I was a little too small to watch it when it first came on. So what happened to us was as we joined up to primary school, a neighbour whose son was uh, older than us would give us all his old Thunderbird toys, which was remarkable, really. All his old dinkies in immaculate condition and his rows and tiles and stuff. So we were playing with the toys before we saw the series. And then, yeah, I, I saw a series of repeats and like everybody else, got into Thunderbirds. I think I'm the same, you know, I've obviously got older brothers and sisters, two of which were sort of born in the late 50s. I don't remember it, but I do remember we had, like you say, some of the toys and we had some of the annuals and stuff. At the time, I didn't really kind of know that they were marionettes as such. Didn't really sort of notice that until much later on. But there we go. Thunderbirds was obviously created by Jerry and Sylvia Anderson. And their wonderful team, people like Derek Meddins, who did all the special effects, and Brian Johnson, and the amazing team of writers and technicians they had there. Again, before we really get into the episode, we should talk about them being made as kind of like small feature films or live action ITC type series. Even though they have marionettes, they were still filmed in the same way as you would film a television series, albeit on a smaller scale. And I think a lot of that was overlooked by critics. But when you look at the magic that's created on screen, my God, how good were those guys who filmed that show and created all the models and the sculpting of the marionettes? All of that is just unbelievable, really. It was all down to Jerry's ultimate want to be a proper full-on film director. And he put that heart and soul quality into Thunderbirds and these other shows. And as you say, like anything that came out of the ATV stroke ITC stable, these guys were making mini movies. And it's all right to say, yeah, OK, it's on a smaller scale. You've got this, that and the other. But when you consider, yes, you're not working with live action actors, but you've got to create that entire world. And when, when you look at how amazingly that was done, it's quite a remarkable feat. I think even between Stingray and Thunderbirds, you can see a huge lift off, no pun intended. When I was watching one of the episodes the other day, and you just look at those split titles, and this is as good as live action. To describe it as a sort of a puppet show would be really demeaning. Mm. To me, you're watching an ITC action adventure show. I would agree with you there. And I'm glad you mentioned those titles because probably the thing is a lot of people associate with Thunderbirds is that iconic five, four, three, two, one countdown. And then that title sequence and that 
they call the music the Thunderbirds March. How it all just perfectly sits together because you've got the craft taking off, you've got the introduction of the characters, probably one of the most iconic title sequences of the 60s and probably of all time. I just... wonder how much it influenced later ones. I mean, you take a show my dad worked on, like The Professionals, and The Professionals titles, certainly for some of the series, it starts with you've got the silhouette of each of the actors and then it becomes the actor. You've already had that in Thunderbirds. And so those titles in Thunderbirds are treating those characters almost as actors in those titles. Yeah, what you've got with the titles is the impact when you look at them, if you, if you time them. That countdown lasts 10 seconds. Within 10 seconds, you've got the hook, you've got all the vehicles introduced, and then you've got the teaser sequence, which is never too long, never gives too much away. And shortly after, you've got the character introductions, which again, only 25 seconds, bang, bang, bang. That is economy. But that has got the viewer in and hooked straight away. I'm sure I brought this up when we looked at Zoo Gang. In theory, I don't like teasers that show you what's going to come. But actually here, they're so smartly and swiftly edited, they don't really spoil what's to come, do they? I also think they're actually streamlined from the Stingray titles. If you look at Stingray, it's incredible, again, title sequence, but it kind of feels like it goes on quite long. But as you say in this one, Smudge, it's much tighter in terms of editing and more compact, so it doesn't kind of feel too long. It's perfect in length. A typical Thunderbirds episode has a budget of about £40,000. That was upped because originally the series started out as a 25-minute format. It was shown to Lou Grade, who loved it so much. He said, I think this is a feature film or this is a movie. Let's expand it. And I think you can see in some of those early episodes, in particular, I think Sun Probe, it really suffers where they've had to pad that 25 minutes into 50 minutes. But this is a, written as a 50 minute episode. And this absolutely hurtles along in terms of pace. There's no slack in it at all. There's no dull moments. It just goes wham, bam, thank you, man. And for inspiration, I think it's a work of genius that the Thunderbirds crew here, they're looking at what's going on. They know Danger Man, the Saint. They know James Bond. They know the Man from Uncle. They know all the ITC action adventure shows up to that point because in the TV21 universe, a lot of these programmes are discussed. They have the Lady Penelope meets and she goes off and meets Patrick McGowan or she goes off and meets Roger Moore. I love this. This is a brilliant homage to the Spy Craze action adventure series. It's done with such subtle humour and taste and I don't think you could have probably got a better homage in anything that was made at that time. What do you guys think? There is a bit of a satire as well. They're almost sort of playing with 007. Lady Penelope basically has all the cards in her hand. She is the boss. And there is almost a wink at, well, actually, Bond. Bond's just a son, as in Bonson. Lady Penelope is the boss. And I think this is where you do realise those episodes where she doesn't appear or doesn't appear for more than a few moments, you really miss it. It just starts off bang straight away. You've got that wonderful Riviera sets. But as soon as you get into that, you've got that marvellous pastiche music. Peter Gunn meets 007, the twangy guitar. You know, there's more than a, just a nod and a wink. I mean, we've had a previous tilt at 007 when one of the characters has come in and thrown his hat onto the hat stand like Connery would. But this is to bond what Carry On Screaming was to Hammer. They get it sort of pitch perfect. I'm glad that we talk about that opening shot there of the Monte Carlo type of style harbour. You know, it's such a wonderful set. And you would think that to create all those models and get that working so well, you know, because there's explosions, it's really, really clever. But I particularly like the direction of the frogman peering into the cabin right at the start of this episode. And then he fires his shots at the guy who sat in the cabin. I mean, that shot is just so typical of a sort of spy film. I mean, brilliant. 
It also stands out because it's got the combination of the live action hands, because this opening sequence is quite live action heavy. And you've got the hand with the gun and the puppet in the background. It's smooth. You don't sort of react to that. You just take it as natural. And it's, it's like you say, it's what you see in a dozen spy movies. Clever use of scale as well, because that would have been very hard to achieve. There's a great use of scale in the bay itself when you've got the main yacht and then you've got the slightly smaller models and slightly smaller models and it gives what's in the tank. It gives it wonderful depth of field and the set background is absolutely beautiful. And it's quite a cold, clinical scene as well. It's the six, I counted it as six bullets, I think they say in script five. Yeah, I counted Mm -hmm. six um, too. The guy's just dispatched and I think that cold, clinical feel carries on in the shipwreck scene afterwards because there's no suggestion of bringing the poor guy's body back for a burial it's i'm just looking for the missing plans when you look at that that shooting clearly reflects the early shooting in dr no where the guy comes into bond chalet and bond just unloads the gun into him i mean i would have watched that as a kid and not even thought about it because it's like cowboys and indians But looking at it now, I found it incredibly stark. And like you say, the sequence to go down to the wreck of the yacht is very good. And it is just as callous as Bond. At one point, he lifts the filing cabinet up from the bloke's legs. But that's about all he does. And all it's for is he's looking for something. He doesn't give a damn. I mean, these are honestly works of art, these sets. Like you mentioned earlier, that the nighttime Riviera seascape. Here again with the seabed, I'm not sitting there watching it thinking, well, this is super marionation. And I'm thinking I'm down on the seabed. The level yeah. of detail as well, and the minutest detail, because if you look at the frogman suit that he's wearing, it's almost identical to what you'll see Richard Barrett wear in the Champions when he's a frogman or even in 007. And even to the point they've got the little roundel on the chest with the maker's name and all of this. I mean, like when you're making a frogman suit, do you really need to include that? Obviously, when they do this, (laughs) they do. The detail in all of this is astonishing. I think actually, now you mentioned that, those are the suits from the champions, the typhoon Mm. with the yellow marker on. And as you say, it's just such a precise replica. The hard thing about this is you've got to create that entire world to scale. And and that is really what sticks out with Thunderbirds, the high production values. And it's difficult to actually get an exact filming date for this episode because the Thunderbirds team worked on a number of episodes at the same time. They had two sort of crews running and episodes were filmed in parts and they jumped around a bit. So, But all we know is that it was summer sort of autumn 1965 and first shown on ATV in early January 66. So we're right at the heart of the spy craze. And of course, shot in colour, we should point that out because when it was first shown, people would, would have seen it in black and white. It would probably look quite Danger Man ish, I think, in black and white. I've never turned the contrast or the colour down. So I might try that and see what it looks mm-hmm. like. We have got this wonderful contrast between quite a cold clinical Cold War espionage. But the wonderful humour in this episode throughout, a lot of which would have probably gone over 10-year-olds, but that's part of the fun. There is something in this for everyone. One trivial point I mentioned in my notes, and I do love, as he's rummaging through the drawers to find the thing, those addicts like me who love their freeze frame button, they will notice that in the drawers are old copies of, well, current copies back then, actually, of the trade magazine Kine Weekly. And one of them's got Sid James on the front. There's obviously a copy of TV21 in there because when he flips it up, there's a Dalek on the back and there's a little piece of script page for Lady Penelope dialogue from another episode. That's just me with my trivia hat on. Yeah, but we love all that. After the opening, it's not even a teaser, really. It's quite a long bit. You get the episode title coming up. Smudge mentioned there, the man from MI5, Bond-style Peter Gunn type theme. Then we move to Tracy Island and we get the more regular part of Thunderbirds in a typical episode. You know, you kind of see what's going on on the islands and Brains is running in an experiment there. Here's a bit of trivia for you, Smudge. That little sub is from the episode Desperate Intruder. So there's an inter-episode link there. And you get who I think is very boring and very characterless and a bit like Gene Barry. You get John relaying the message to his father. 
And you get Alan jumping in the uh, swimming pool to basically mess up Brain's experiment. You get a bit of all the boys, so they have appeared in the episode, if you know what I mean, but they won't appear again, some of them. But this episode really is all about Lady Penelope and Parker. I would say that they are the stars of the entire series. They are superb double act. The voicing between Sylvia Anderson and David Graham is so such fun. And I love Parker's, obviously, he drops his H's and then he puts H's in and things like that. But that whole relationship here, for me, is the key to probably, I think, why Thunderbirds was so successful to both boys and girls. There is such a strong character definition there, which we'll touch on again later, no doubt. But what I do like, and to give due credit, is in the character design from Sylvia, who would have worked all this up, that thing about giving the pilots the different colour identity sashes, to me, that was a little touch of genius because it not only separates them for the viewer, it gives the younger kids a chance to sort of pick their colour. You know which character you relate to most because it's colour yellow, colour orange. I think that's a great little touch from Sylvia, but Parker and Penelope really do steal the show. They're also important from a narrative point of view, aren't they? Because obviously International Rescue have certain rules. They don't get involved in politics, police, a number of other things. And when they do need to go down that route, it has to be through the London agent. They're not going to do the missions that Lady Penelope can. That essentially doesn't remove her from international rescue, particularly in this episode. You can see that she's a vital cog. She's a big part of the team and her importance gives the impetus to the rescue at the end. She is a sort of arm that can be shoved off into certain missions, and we do see this now and then. But I think she's quite vital to the team as well. I like the fact that she's much more down to earth. You know, she doesn't really get involved in going into space and some of those types of adventures, which I... I'm not so keen on personally. I mean, I much prefer this type of episode or the Cham Cham, Perils of Penelope. Her episodes for me are obviously the more stronger and standout ones. I don't know why, but I'm sure it's to do with the Parker and Penelope relationship. And I find that much more fun because the humour in it is brilliant. But also, like, I guess I'm not really a huge sci-fi fan. So, like I say, something like Sun Probe, I find incredibly dull. But that's just me. Mm -hmm. But she is a proper character, isn't she? I mean, in the yep. sense that, mm. that Scott or Virgil, they're somewhat robotic characters. They're not going to come up with witty quips. This episode is full of witty quips to the point where the baddie towards the end is going to say, oh, she's really cool, she is. And she is full of dry humour which we're not going to get from the actual members of International Rescue. That's very true. I mean, the guys, the pilots, are really the generic action heroes. And, and as Jazz said, Penny is something for girls. Not that we should be stereotyping a A's and B's. At that time, Penny was a strong character for the younger kids' market. And it was great for them to have that, for want of a better phrase, role model. You had something to attract viewers across the spectrum. Would it be fair enough to say also, with quite a few of the female Super Mario Nation characters, there is a sexual free song. I mean, in Stingray, you've got this love triangle where Troy is fancied by Marina and by Atlanta. And Atlanta will often say, well, I know what my biggest problem is, as in it's Marina. And here, obviously, Alan, who is meant to be the boyfriend of Tintin, there are those gender dynamics that go on. I don't want to make too much of it, but they are there. But similarly, particularly as you come back to the Thunderbirds Go film, Alan is edging towards Lady Penelope as well. As Jazz said, there's a lot in there that when we were nippers and watching it, we would just watch it. It would wash across our eyes. But when you come back to it, there's bits for everybody. There's little bits of cheekiness, like when Penelope's tied up and Carl's accent suddenly drifts into sort of Tom Jones, I think it is. There's that sort of naughtiness, that twinkle. Well, she wants to know, doesn't she, whether Carl's going to get, I think her expression is, morbid pleasure out of this sort of delayed countdown. And she's almost thriving on it. Penelope's introduced at the point of Fire Flash from the very first episode. And she's flying over to the south of France. She meets up with Parker in Fab One. 
what I do like about this is where she calls the British agent who's called Bonson. I really quite like this as well, that there's a lovely connection here because Bonson later appears in a Lady Penelope comic in 1966, although he has blonde hair, not dark hair. So that is that whole Anderson universe that they put into comics as well as being on screen. But I love that French accent she does where she talks to him via video phone, which, again, is brilliant because, you know, it's kind of predicting the future in a way and it's set to audio only. But she does a fantastic French accent there. And Bonson says to her, how do I know if I can trust you? And she says, you don't. Brilliant. And the size of that video phone, it takes up a whole corner of the bedroom in the, the hotel. But it is, as we say, it's penny calling the shots. You don't know if you can trust me, but you have to trust me. You wanted the help. I've read somewhere that Bonson was played down because there was a fear that the producers from 007, Saltzman and Broccoli, not long before this, they'd taken Peter Rogers to task for the poster for Carry On Spying, which basically spoofed the 00 trademark. And so people have said somewhere that Bonson is played down here because of that. I don't think that's right. Bonson is he's a fairly stereotypical spy character, relatively peripheral. He moves the plot along. He gives us the big point of the plot and then he gets out of the way. But if they'd wanted to play it down that much, they wouldn't have called him Bondson, would they? They'd have called him Jones or Smith or whatever else. Mm. They clearly wanted that connection to be made. And talking of Bonson, there's that lovely midnight meeting in the forest where Penelope has him at gunpoint, which is so sort of typical spy movie again. And she knows about rare guns and she warns him that if he turns his head round, he's going to get in big trouble. And sure enough, he tries to turn his head round and then we get Parker and Fab One warning him with a bit of a shot there. That's played beautifully and wonderfully lit and very atmospheric. Yeah, and one thing I've got to mention there, a shout out for the ITC live action owl. Now, what does she say? Move a muscle and I'll blow your head off. There's no doubting that there's no bullshit with her at all. She just comes straight to it and you get the feeling she would have done. This is her thing. This is her plan. She is running the show. There's a rescue because you have to have a rescue in an episode of Thunderbirds. There's a rescue and it's a different rescue because it's one of their own. But... It's not the key factor of the show this time. It comes very late on, and we're into episode 20 by now. So even the launches are fairly perfunctory. It's just in launch, bang, not all the sliding stuff and all the palm trees and whatever. It's just to do the job in the last 10 minutes of this episode. But it is by far her episode. This is a beautiful scene, isn't it? I mean, I love the fact that we're going to come back to the same location later on. So they're almost twin scenes. And I think this is an example of where she and Parker are a great double act because when Bonson is going to ignore her advice and he's shot into the tree, he says, well, the lady told you not to move. You know, they're a great double act. It's lovely the way they do that with the disembodied Rolls-Royce microphone voice as well. It's really effective. And a quick bit of trivia, because I know Smudge likes his trivia. The gun that Lady Penelope is using to hold Bonson at gunpoint was later a Lady Penelope Century 21 toy. It was based on that gun that she used in this episode. So there you go. I love the little soundtrack as well as Fab One leaves the forest. That's so typical 60s spy movie. Big shout out there to Barry Gray, who, when it came to it, he had to score this episode in that style. And my God, he did a brilliant job. And then we get to Fab 2, Lady Penelope's Yacht, which I believe is the only time it's seen in the series. Basically, Penny goes undercover as Gail Williams to expose the murderers. Again, it just flies along at a phenomenal pace, doesn't it? She contacts International Rescue to say, yeah, I'm on the case and I'm doing it. And the boys are all in the lounge. So you get that little bit of the boys again. But there's no actual sort of fat in this episode, is there? It's just so well tightly written and played and the attention to detail we get a front cover of francois and it's all in perfect french the mannequin will denounce the murderer literal translation of it and i just love that attention to detail they didn't need to show a newspaper but they do 
and the sets of Fab Two, as you say, like any of the sets, they're all gloriously detailed, and and there's some great work on the boat. I love following on from the newspaper and Carl coming into the story again. I love that mirror shot that mm. David Lane uses. When you look at that and you think of it in terms of how the puppets were manipulated from that overhead bridge, you've got camera facing back of Penelope, so the operator has got to operate Penelope sort of back to front, really. And then you've got the reflection of Carl, which means you've got to be very, very careful with your camera angle. And it, it more or less means the puppets are working in an enclosed set. There's a fourth wall or whatever you want to think. And I think that's an incredibly clever shot to do in something which some people would dismiss as, quote, a puppet series. And then when that bullet goes into the mirror, what does she say? Oh, seven years bad luck. I hope you're not superstitious. And this is wonderful. She's the ultimate 60s cool action woman. I was going to say with that set as well, I'm not really aware of the strings, even though they're there. You know, they're not distracting. And I know there was always that conversation. Oh, I wish they'd paint the strings out. To be honest, I don't really notice them because I'm, I'm just watching the episode. I know they're there, but they don't make any difference to me. I think to rub them out would almost be ridiculous because self-evidently they're not real people. And even the notorious problem of walking the puppets when they're leaving the boat, yes, you can't see the legs. But I think the motions the operators achieve are pretty good. One thing I would say about this was obviously there's smoking in it as well with the gang members when they're down stuck in the bottom of the submarine. I thought that was quite funny. But And why would they make them smoke? But then I guess, you know, it, everyone smoked back then. Again, it adds to the sort of realism of it, doesn't it? Well, I yeah, mean, it's so real. Not only is it a roll up, but the ash is falling off his cigarette as he's talking. It's brilliantly realistic. That they must have used that old toy shop smoking monkey stuff to make them smoke. It seems incredible now, but again, we would have just looked at it and not thought about it. But the henchmen are fairly thick-eared stereotypes, really. They don't add a great deal to the story. And Carl, of course, is riding for a fall because he says to them at one point, he's always right. So, you know, he's going to come <laughs> down in flames. We didn't mention there that Penelope gives Park of the Night off. And he sort of says, oh, Monte Carlo's nearby. <laughs> when she sees him going off, she says, what's in the case then, Parker? And then all his safe robbing tools fall out, which is another lovely little touch because that's part of Parker's backstory that he was a criminal safe cracker and she rescued him from a life of crime. So, again, lovely. Old okay. habits die hard. What I love to that is the sort of musical accompaniment to that little gag when he's coming along the side of the ship with the case in hand and he's singing to himself and it, it's the old sort of musical song, the man who broke the bank at Monte Carlo, but in Parker's words, it's the bloke who did the bank at Monte Carlo. I, I think it's really funny. I guess we have to talk probably about, I think, the best scene in the whole thing. It's funny, and it, it's one of the scenes that I remembered when I was younger. I don't know why, maybe it's just because it's so fun. It's that whole in the boathouse where Carl's been talking to Penelope, and eventually he's had enough of talking to her. And she says, are you going to tie me up? And he says, you bet I am. And then she says, well, I don't mind really, but can I fix my face? She contacts International Rescue. And then when he does go to tie her up, she says, Oh, don't tie them too tightly, because I, I am rather delicate. It's just superb. I mean, Sylvia Ransom must have had a ball doing that. Absolutely. I mean, it's brilliant. And there's attention to detail, little touches when she is sort of making up her face. David Lane cuts back to a shot of Carl leaning against one of the control bits. And the puppet is just tapping his leg as he's waiting with impatience. It's little things like that that make it like a proper movie. That scene is wonderfully camp, but not camp. It's played reasonably straight. Carl is driven mad by her, but he admires her. Mm. You know, he goes back to the submarine and goes, boy, could that dame talk, but she's cool, as I said earlier. And so I think he admires her sort of very upper class British bravado. And, you know, moving swiftly along as the episode does, there's that whole bit where he knocks her compact, which is her way of communicating with International Rescue onto the floor. And they can't hear her. Jeff tells her she's got to get closer and she scuttles her chair along. But then there's that wonderful bit where she sort of topples herself over 
And David Lane's direction where he's got her with her face is on the side. And that whole shot where she's in the kind of mirror of the compact is just so cinematic. It's bloody brilliant. Another thing I love about that sequence as we're going back to Tracy Island is that in the portrait picture, they use the light up beads as the emergency signal. Mm. I thought that was really, really novel. I don't remember if that's in elsewhere. I, it's very, very good. And that whole sequence as the marionette you're trying to trundle across whilst tied to the chair. This is as good as live action. It's a sort of drama at this point you would expect in an episode of whether it's a saint or danger man or this is up there, same quality. Then, of course, they realise that she's in trouble and they do the usual of sending the boys off to do the part of international rescue that they do in every episode, which is a rescue. And I think you said there, Smudge, earlier on that the episode is much later in the run so that it's very quick, the taking off. There's not all the elaborate things where they have to go down shoots. Their costumes are there for them to change into. You already know what's going to happen there. And that's what I like about this. Uh, again, talking about pace of episode, I find in some of those earlier episodes, I think that was used for padding mm -hmm. and slows the speed of the actual episodes down. You don't get any of that here. It's like, wham, bam, thank you, man. You know that Thunderbird one's got to go, off it goes. Even Jeff says they've got to fly the things at maximum speed. This gives this shows, again, the importance of Penelope and they've got to get there quickly and they've got to solve it. Once they do get there, there's some interesting bits of Thunderbird flying. I think this is the only episode I read in Chris Bentley's Making a Thunderbird's book that you see Thunderbird 2 dropping the pod and then Thunderbird 4 is launched from that pod. I suppose if you're a fanatic of Thunderbirds, it's important for that you see the actual launching of Thunderbird 4 in quite more considerable detail than you've seen it before. It's a side-on shot coming out of the pod. And again, this is the skill of David Lane for me, because David Lane was an editor before he was a director. Look how smooth that transition is from that side shot of coming out of the pod to the front shot of coming down the ramp. That's a beautiful piece of editing. <laughs> the episode is quickly kind of wrapped up I don't feel there's too much tension in that. Yes, they have to get there before the bomb explodes, but we kind of know they are. Again, I think that's pacing. It's not like you're waiting for ages and ages. You know it's going to happen, yes, but it's, it's done very quickly, and I like that. But we get that great gadget with the sort of paralyzer with the drill and then the tranquilizing of the men in the submarine. And I guess a little bit like Danger Man, there is always the fun of when you're going to come across a new gadget. I don't know if that gadget has been used in a different episode. But I love the idea of, oh, here's a new gadget. What intrigues me about this sort of rescue sequence is when you look at literally the mass questions of scale. Towards the end, when he lands Thunderbird 1 by the boathouse, he does some very deft flying. And then you see... Thunderbird 1 alongside the boat, and then you suddenly appreciate the massive scale of that thing. And then when you consider that Thunderbird 2 is even bigger, and you go back to when he's flying the thing at zero feet on, along the sea, putting the sonar device down, how on earth is he keeping that thing flying? Oh, uh, well, I, I You're was not never... really looking for realism, Smudge. I was going to say, I was never <laughs> any good at physics at school, so it's all beyond me. After Penelope's been rescued... And Gordon's got the plans. We go back to the forest where we have our second meeting with Bonson, very similar to the first one. I like the fact the plans are in the tree, which is a bit like mm -hmm. Danger Man. Again, eye on detail. It's just great. Obviously, the end where Parker fesses up that he's lost the yacht in the, in the casino is just wonderful. In the plan drop, though, there's that wonderful little thing again from Penelope that ultimatum that she delivers to him when she says you try to track us down and he's basically essentially saying you come and find us and you're dead meat that's a pretty powerful thing for Penny and it, it's a good sort of closure to the Bonson part of things where as you say yeah there's the humour of Parker saying he's done a bit of extreme gambling while he was out at the casino to, as the tag scene I mean that tag scene I actually think in a bizarre way, it's one of those occasions when having mannequins is a benefit because when he says, oh, I got a bit carried away, I thought I had a system. And the camera turns to Penelope and her face reveals nothing. Is she seriously pissed off with him for losing her yacht? 
is she about to laugh or smile or shake her head? We don't know. And that almost enigmatic puppet face works brilliantly for the humour there. We don't Mm. know how she's going to react. We never find out. That brings me back to a point I wanted to cover earlier and I forgot completely. I do apologise. When she's chiding Parker about going out with his safe breaking tools, there's a full on shot of Penelope, a close up of Penelope, and they've changed the heads and you've got that slightly smiling head. That's a lovely little touch. Again, it's that move towards realism for these mini movies. And and there is so much of that in there. I would argue as well, the characterisation of Lady Penelope, she's got more character, more depth of character, more to her than Gene Barry ever had in The Adventurer. I mean, you could have put him in in Thunderbirds and she would have outacted him even then. Well, he was wooden just without the strings. One thing I did mean to mention, I didn't mention earlier, when Scott finally rescues Penelope, he asks her, you know, are you okay, et cetera, et cetera. And she makes the comment that she thrives on danger. I think she actually says that's what makes life interesting, the uncertainty. And again, that's what separates her from the pilots in international rescue. They're going there on their missions. There's no sense that they thrive on danger or they find it exciting. But it's what she gets off on. Well, her sort of strap line in the comic was elegance, danger and charm. Again, that carries through into the comic world that they so brilliantly achieved with TV21 and then the Lady Penelope comics. We should say that the Man from MI5 theme was such a great theme and popular that it was actually released on one of the TV21 EPs as the lead track. I'm sure there's some collectors out there who've got them. I've got some TV21 EPs. There is a Man from MI5 and Other Themes TV21 EP, which is absolutely fantastic. I just wonder if Derek ran out of letter sets again, because there's no dot between the M and the I, or was it deliberately to avoid confrontation? The story came from Alan Fennell, who was very much at the top of his game because he was juggling a role at TV21 and doing episode chores. And no doubt, like I say, the TV21 influence came from there. Mm -hmm. Alan Patillo did the script. It's the usual voice artists that we come to know with the series. But again, for me, it's just David Graham and Sylvia Anderson. I can't speak highly enough of Sylvia Anderson. I have to say, she's often been tried to be written out of history She was ignored for years by the fan club. And I just think, actually, this really was a team show. It wasn't just Jerry. It was Jerry with Sylvia, with Derek Beddins, Alan Patillo and David Lane and Alan Fennell and Brian Johnson and all the rest of the crew. It was a team effort. And we should not ever underestimate the value of Sylvia Anderson to the Super Mario Nation shows and beyond. She's almost a lone female voice, I mean, because she makes the comment that it was an all-male writing team. And this is one of the reasons she felt that initially they didn't really know what to do with Lady Penelope. You know, I have read where she has said that Lady Penelope was partly created because she was bored with female characters on TV being, yes, dear, and would you like a cup of tea, dear, and this sort of thing. And this is a real blow for female emancipation. People often talk about Emma Peel and Cathy Gale. Lady Penelope is up there, isn't she? She's there just on the cusp of the women's liberation movement. And it was a masterstroke to make such a strong female character. And like Jazz said, so much is owed to Sylvia in, in the professional relationship of the Andersons. I get the impression she was the one who could manage the teams, talk to people, and she organised the actors. As a kid, I always thought of it as Sherry and Sylvia Anderson. I never thought of it as anything different. And it, it, it is rather sad, really, how in some recent times her contribution has been, to some extent, belittled, and it really needs to be back up there. I would say airbrushed, and it's time for that airbrushing to stop. I personally think it's pretty outrageous the way that some of those campaigns were ran against her. But anyway, we move on. There was a little bit of controversy. I'm going to sort of wrap it up now. I think this is the best Thunderbirds episode, personally. I would watch it over and over again because it's just delightful. It's such fun. It's a loving homage 
to ITC Action Venture. It's done with detail, with beautiful lighting, beautiful cinematography, wonderful script. And if you haven't seen it or you haven't seen it in a long time, I would say get your DVD or your Blu-ray out and sit down and just that 50 minutes will fly and you will have such fun. It's a wonderful little nugget of pop culture of the period. Fabulous. It's a proper work of art. Uh, and I think that applies to everything. It applies to the really sophisticated and well-structured script, the way it's directed, the sets. It's wonderful. And, you know, what they produce from a uh, fun factory in Slough, incredible. Well, on that note, we'll be saying goodbye. I hope you enjoyed this new format. Please do send us some feedback. We'll be back very soon with another ITC Entertainer World podcast specific episode, which we'll discuss between ourselves what we're going to do. So until then, I'll say goodbye. So goodbye from me. Well, goodbye from me. Yeah. And it's farewell till next time from me too. FAB. And we'll see you next time. been listening to the itc entertain the world podcast thunderbirds the man from mi5 with jazz wiseman rodney marshall and al smudge it was a bitter and twisted production for the morning after